Uh, good evening. Thank you all for coming and those watching online. Uh, I'm Corey Hutchins, Interim Director of the Journalism Institute here at Colorado College. Uh, before we begin tonight, I'd like to acknowledge that we're holding this event on the, uh, within the unceded territory of the Ute peoples. The earliest documented peoples also include the Apache, the Arapaho, Comanche, and Cheyenne. Uh, you all might have seen a recent uh, news clip here in the Springs, including uh, one of our own faculty members talking about uh, efforts to change the name of Pikes Peak to its original Ute name. And uh, I think it's something to think about as institutions, including our own, grapple uh, with our histories. And just today, in fact, one of our speakers on the stage tonight, Wesley Lowry, published a major story in the Philadelphia Inquirer about that newspaper's own history, uh, about a reckoning in American journalism, and about whether it's possible for centuries-old institutions to decide they're going to become anti-racist. Uh, perhaps we'll hear a little more about that tonight. Uh, so I'm honored to introduce our speakers this evening, working journalists, both of whom taught recent classes here uh, at Colorado College for the Journalism Institute. Wesley Lowry is a Pulitzer Prize winning journalist, author of the book, They Can't Kill Us All, The Struggle for Black Lives. He worked for the Washington Post, CBS News, 60 Minutes Plus. Uh, he's a contributor to the Marshall Project, GQ Magazine, and others. And in 2020, he wrote a, a, a widely read piece for the New York Times headlined, A Reckoning Over Objectivity Led by Black Journalists. Uh, and I saw him give a keynote speech to a uh, kind of a conference of journalism educators the next summer. And he made a, a self-deprecating remark. He, he said something to the effect of that he felt like he might get run out of journalism, uh, run out of the industry before he ever got the chance to teach the next generation of journalists. So I'm humbled that he accepted an invitation to prove himself wrong. Uh, his class here on campus, the history and future of American news just wrapped up. Uh, Julian Rubenstein, award-winning journalist, wrote for the New Yorker. He's written for the New York Times Magazine and he's written for Rolling Stone and others. His book, The Holly, uh, Five Bullets, One Gun, and the Struggle to Save an American Neighborhood came out last year, one of my favorite books that I uh, read last year. And it's about a, a neighborhood in Denver, if you're not familiar uh, with The Holly. Uh, his documentary about Colorado anti-gang activist Terrence Roberts comes out soon. I think we're going to see a clip about that this evening and talk about it. Uh, so I'm going to get out of the way now. I expect these two have plenty to talk about. Um, I imagine they'll uh, talk about media, why some stories get covered, why some might not. Uh, I think they'll talk about covering social justice movements locally and nationally, and probably about uh, what good journalism can do and, and sometimes when it might fall short. Um, I'd like to also thank the ESLO International Center for Journalism and New Media at the University of Denver for helping us with this event. Uh, some of their uh, faculty and students are here, so thanks for coming down uh, to Colorado Springs. And uh, with that, I will let our distinguished guests take it from here. We're going to open it up to a Q&A when they're done. Awesome. Wesley Corey. Lowry, Julian Runestein. Thank Corey, you. Thank you. Thank you so much. And the, uh, the lesson of that introduction is to not make any self-deprecating jokes about yourself. You'll end up having <laughs> to do more work. Um, but uh, it has been great, as Corey noted. Um, I just wrapped up uh, teaching a block class uh, today. Uh, today was our last day of class, looking at the, the history of American journalism as a lens through which to imagine the future of American journalism and to grapple with a lot of the big questions facing uh, the institution of media in this moment, uh, whether it be trust, polarization, uh, the, the <laughs> topsy-turvy economics and business models. Um, and I have just really enjoyed the last three and a half weeks of listening to Colorado college students uh, teach me things and uh, come up with smart ideas that I couldn't have come up with on my own about perhaps what happens um, in the future. And so it's been awesome. It's been excellent. I'm really looking forward to this conversation with Julian, who's an amazing journalist, who's done great work uh, that I've really admired. And so I was really excited for the opportunity for us to get together and have this conversation with the folks who could make it out. And obviously it's still COVID, but we also know a lot of folks are watching via streaming as well. And so I'm really excited. 
Same. And I just want to say uh, a few things. First off, thank you to Colorado College and the University of Denver. have both been huge supporters of my work, and it's meant so much going through through this time. And I'm also excited that to, to meet Wesley, who's done some incredible work. And we, because we just missed each other, I, as some of you know, finished a, teaching a half block um, here. I think like probably left the day before you arrived. And here I am catching on your last night in Colorado Springs, where I think I told you was the getaway for me when things got really hairy and I was down here. And um, so I, I feel like it's a nice uh, place to, um, to have this discussion and Wesley I know you today I only found out I had no advance notice nothing was <laughs> slipped into my inbox but you have this blockbuster report which I'm looking forward to dive deeper into and I wanted to ask you a little bit about what you put out today and it seems you did sort of a white paper of sorts looking at the Philadelphia Inquirer over the years and one of the things we'll discuss a little bit tonight is the question, as we said, it's, it's almost not even always what gets covered or doesn't, but even how it gets covered. And maybe I'd love to hear just, just a little about what you put out today and what you looked into and found at the Philadelphia Inquirer. Sure. Um, so I, I got a call, um, I guess it should have been last fall, end of the, end of the summer, early fall, um, from a good friend of mine, Aaron Haynes, uh, who is a reporter and editor with the 19th, which is a nonprofit news organization uh, that covers issues of, of gender. Uh, but Aaron and I have been, I have known each other for a really long time. She's a really close friend. Um, we had served previously together on the national board of the National Association of Black Journalists. And she called me and said, uh, she now serves on the board of LenFest, which is the nonprofit organization that owns and operates the Philadelphia Inquirer. Um, and, the, and she said that as part of the newspapers post George Floyd reckoning, they had commissioned or, or seeking to commission a project called the More Perfect Union. And the, the conceit of the project was Philadelphia being the birthplace of American democracy and therefore the birthplace of many of the, institu of, of many of the American institutions. Uh, the first hospital, the oldest church, some of the oldest operating newspapers in the country, the list goes on and on and on, um, that the paper itself would undergo a or would conduct a series of pieces that sought, sought to grapple with how have those institutions themselves reckoned with their history and where are they in the process at this time when we're all discussing our history and our future. Um, and so she called me and said, well, to do this project, we have to start by doing a piece on the Inquirer itself. We have to deal with the media as an institution. So we need to bring in someone from the outside who's capable of asking these questions and looking at things and having this conversation. And so the um, and so it was really interesting, right? There's been there's some model, some template for it in the last few years. There've been pieces from the LA Times, the Kansas City Star, uh, a few other places that have sought to kind of reckon with their own history. Although in most of these cases, the papers themselves, the way they do them is they they look back at the papers' coverage of specific historical events. Um, as we thought about this, and Aaron and I talked about it, I thought about it. I didn't actually think I was the right person to do that. Uh, there's a much more qualified person to write a piece about the Inquirer's coverage of the move bombing and whether or not it served Philadelphia or not, right? I'm not an expert of Philadelphia history. I'm not a local, I'm not. But the thing I was equipped to do um, was to tell the story of the Inquirer itself, right? And, and to use the Inquirer as a stand-in for many of the other media institutions that we exist in, right? The Inquirer's story is not dissimilar from many of the surviving newspapers, right? This was a paper that was founded at this point centuries ago. Uh, by the time you get to the mid 1900s, it's kind of the plaything of some rich white aristocrats. The Annenbergs owned the paper and they used it to <laughs> attack their enemies and, and promote, promote their friends. Um, it gets sold to Knight, uh, which eventually becomes Knight Ritter and becomes the crown jewel of one of the great American newspaper chains. Uh, the economic realities begin to set in. Um, and that begins to force the paper to reconsider what its relationship is with the city versus the suburbs versus the region, um, that the glory days are now behind it. Now in the glory days, how integrated they, did they get? Not actually that integrated, right? And then the time ran out. And, and suddenly the internet comes and it zaps the ad revenue and it changes everything about the paper and a place that had never fully integrated now sees uh, the, those small little parts of progress zapped out of it, right? And... So what I did is I set out to tell that story, but then also tell the story of what the paper has been trying to do for the last two years, um, post George Floyd. And, and the Inquirer 
has, I think, been among the most aggressive papers in the extent to which it wants to do the work and wants to do it the right way. And then also try to explore through conversations with members of the community, people who live in Philadelphia, of whether or not that's enough, right? We, we think about the relationships that a newspaper or news organization has with its community. And you can't take that relationship for granted. It's voluntary. Community can just decide it doesn't want to be in a relationship with you anymore, much like anyone else can decide they just don't want to be in a relationship with you anymore. Yeah, I saw plenty of that. Yeah. And, and so you get to the, and so one of the main questions here was, is the inquirer or the boyfriend that went to therapy too late? Right. right. Yeah. Is, is it, you know, is it just because it's doing the work and really wants it to work? That doesn't actually necessarily mean that the harm that was done is something the community can overcome. And I think that that question, I, I don't, I don't, at the end of this piece, I don't come to a conclusion about what's going to happen. But I think that question is vital and it's important because it could, because I think that, and I think accepting the idea that reconciliation is not a given that in some cases our institutions have been here and their relationships have been so adversarial, so oppositional, uh, so negative to parts of our community that those parts of our community, we may never be able to rebuild those, those relationships, right? Um, and, and I think that, and so the piece tries to look at that idea, tries to analyze the work that they're doing, but then also, again, looking at the false promise of, of newspaper integration, that the, the Inquirer hires its first black reporter in 1954, and on the day that George Floyd is killed in 2020, there's one black reporter on its city desk, right? And so you have a 70 year period of, and that's not to say no one was doing any work of integration efforts of, of good faith attempts to do it. And so how do we make sure that the efforts we see today aren't gonna repeat the same pattern of not working unless we understand what had happened prior. And so that was a big part of it. It was a fascinating piece. I'm still getting feedback on it. And so I'm still kind of digesting how I think that went. Um, anytime you write about someone's community or one of their institutions, people are gonna have a lot of feelings about it. But the feedback's been great. And, and it was interesting because it was a piece where um, the editor and publisher of the piece gave us basically complete autonomy. So I was investigating the Philadelphia Inquirer in the pages of the Philadelphia Inquirer without the Inquirer's leadership having a chance to pull anything out or dispute anything or get rid of anything. And so, and I have to give them credit that they did honor that. But what, and what was their response? Yeah, I think that they, you know, I, I, heard, I heard from the editor and the publisher this morning and I'd heard from some other folks prior. And, you know, I, I think that they, I think the impression of the leadership of the Inquirer now is that it's important for them to have these hard conversations. And so even if they might want to quibble with a small thing or they're not quite, that, that they have kind of dispositionally accepted, we need to take our lumps here a little bit because hopefully this helps us turn a corner. And, and if we can show people we're willing to reckon and have these conversations. Now, again, if that's gonna be effective, I think it's a totally different question. But, but I do think, like I said, to the credit of the leadership there, they um, were as hands-off as they said they would be um, and seemed introspective and, and considerate when they read, the, when they finally read the piece. Uh, I think it would be I don't interesting to see whether or not uh, I suppose the remaining kind of comparable paper in Denver, the Post, would consider such a, an undertaking. Well, I'm not so, sure. It's so interesting, right? Because we think about we as journalists, we cover all these institutions. We understand these institutions of history that things shift, they change, and that maybe the things the police were doing in 1968 weren't good. Maybe we should look at that now and consider it, or maybe the way we used to teach this class doesn't work, right? Yet, I, I do think that sometimes we have a real difficulty as journalists accepting that we too are an institution, that our thumb is on the scale of society, that if we live in a society that's inequitable, we, uh, we, we carry some of the responsibility for that, um, at the very least for our, for our failure to effectively challenge whatever that inequality was, much less the extent to which we might have propped it up. Um, and I, but I do think that it's very hard for us to grapple sometimes with that reality. I think that most people who go to journalism do so, uh, we're idealists. We're, we're coming into a field where we're frankly not going to make that much money, going to work really hard, and you do it because you think you're going to help change the world. Um, and I think that there's a, and so it can be very hard to have that chat. Wait, wait, what? The work we did might have been bad? <laughs> might have helped the bad guys? That's really difficult uh, it, collectively. Uh, yeah, but I think that for us, you know, I think that when you look at the history of American journalism, uh, we know that there are any number of issues, any number of spaces through our history where the institution of the media 
has not exactly been on the right side of what was going on, or the status quo was not a thing that was that was um, upholding what our co shared collective values are of liberty and justice and fairness and equity and equality, right? And so I think that knowing that history is what empowers us to today make sure we're making the decisions that are the right ones or the closest to the white ones, right ones that we can make. Um, you know, I, I, I'm glad we started there because, you know, I, I really want to ask you and talk to you a bit about the Holly, uh, the, the book that you've published, which is excellent. And now I know uh, and, are, and are turning in and have done work on a documentary already. I got I had the privilege of watching parts of uh, watching this documentary early. Um, but one thing that's interesting here in the story that you tell the reporting you've done is that the media as an institution is a character in terms of how it covers some of the stories that you are now coming back and covering. And so for the benefit of the audience, could you talk a little bit about the project that you've now finished, the book you've got out, and, and what both your reporting process, but then also just kind of the basic of uh, what is the story that you've now spent years yeah. telling, and telling very well. Thanks. Well, um, the media did become clearly a part of it. Even from the beginning, I recognized this, and it was part of what also made me think about the institution of the media and then, of course, how it plays a role. And it was hard to sort of like get into all that. But first I came to it actually from um, in, it, so I grew up in Denver and like you, I was thinking about it. I mean, you know, I was named for a civil rights leader, Julian Bond. I went into journalism thinking I was going to change the world or make it better or whatever. And I came across a story in 2013 after never having done a story in Denver in my life where I grew up. And I was not living in Denver. I lived in New York at the time. And I just thought, wow, this sounds incredibly fascinating, which was that there was a shooting involving a high profile anti-gang activist who had shot someone at his own peace rally. And he also happened to be in the middle of this high profile redevelopment of his historic black neighborhood. And the redevelopment was being controlled by high profile, very wealthy white um, <clears throat> nonprofits and funders who were wanting to actually redevelop the site after a gang arson had burned it to the ground, this you know historic site. So I'd come out and I'd met Terrence uh, who was the one who pulled the trigger and is the main character in, in, in the story, which involves, I guess, I think someone told me there were 50 something characters in the, in the cast of characters. It's a big cast, but, and, and ultimately I realized though, from talking to him and that I, if I wanted to go further in this story, I would have to actually tell the history of the neighborhood because that there was no way to understand it otherwise. And in doing so, did of course look through all the media reporting that was going on through the years of it and realizing a few different things that included that sometimes there were reports even from the beginning it got me interested and in, even more interested in wanting to figure out how can i tell this story from a perspective that's that's different that is offering a community perspective which is about a story that involves a lot of law enforcement stuff a story that's often told by law enforcement sources different sources, right? Who are the sources mm -hmm. of stories? And over the years, I could see that um, the stories that I was hearing from directly from people involved were very much different from stories I was hearing in the media, not always. And I did use um, media reports throughout the process to, to occasionally show what I could about it. But it was interesting to see exactly what sort of it seems you've discovered there, which was that a sort of a, um, uh, a just a disconnect in some ways between the the narrative of the that was sort of like being told from this sort of institutional level and a narrative that existed in the community, mm -hmm. and that that dichotomy did become of interest to me in telling the bigger story, which involves you know this person who was a third generation resident of the neighborhood ultimately being charged with a crime uh, that he he believed he'd been attacked on this particular day and that was not the prevailing idea certainly at the time uh, uh, that I got on board and, and I don't even know what it is today I mean those who read the book probably have a quite a different idea now than you might have read I in the book as you know I I, I call it an alternate history of a, of a case and, a, and of a community mm -hmm. I know Corey do we have a clip maybe don't yeah if you're now, now might make sense to do that. I can we can show this short clip from the movie. I give you a little taste of 
the uh, uh, the characters and and a setting just to set it up uh, to make sure it's on the right place. Um, you're going to see the main character on it. He was charged, uh, so he shot someone. He, he and and paralyzed a young man who was a gang member who he'd worked with. Um, he believed he was. Um, he believed he was attacked on the day in question. And the movie, this clip starts with a, a scene in his office and then just a short aftermath about what happened immediately afterward, which included um, Denver getting another big federal grant to fight gang violence and what, uh, what, what happened um, in, that, in, in that ensuing period, which was extremely revealing about a number of things. Uh, so anyway, we'll watch this short clip and talk to you on the other side. All they got is a person with a video and they've got someone that says you shot Hassan. Oh, wait a minute. They don't need the person that says that you shot Hassan because you say you shot Hassan. I was afraid of Hassan. And if I plead to anything, it takes away my right to a trial by jury. And I'm not going to take a deal to go to prison over what these men wanted to have happen to me to take my position and take my life, even the police possibly. Best we can tell, people have been afraid to talk to us. Best we can tell, people have been told by much to not cooperate. We don't 100% know why he's saying that. What we need is to be able to show the jury why your fear was legitimate. I don't know what to say, but let's see if a jury of 12 thinks that I didn't have a right to defend my life. And that's it. And I need y'all to do that. I need y'all to take me to trial and fight for my life. story right now a weekend of violence in denver four shootings ending with four people dead and within the last 90 minutes denver police confirming an increase in gang violence in the metro area a coordinated and multi-layered approach to halting the gang violence that is playing in some of our Northeast Denver neighborhoods. Immediately, I directed our police department to provide additional staffing and patrols in the affected neighborhoods. Since I've heard about the police, I was five years old hearing about more patrols. I was eight years old. More patrols. <laughs> I was 13. I wasn't even a gang member yet. They're going to do more patrols because this. Then I was a gang member. It was more patrols. It's up to the killers to stop the killing. No, no gang activists or nobody, even the police, can't just accredit themselves for stopping the violence. It's the people who got to get the credit for that because they stop when they want to stop. And they stop when they believe in something. So you begin reporting and Terrence is facing what attempted murder charges. He is, he's an anti-violence, anti-gang activist, former gang member himself who has become uh, prominent. He's been doing work in the Holly in this historically under-resourced, historically relatively violent part of Denver. And what is Terrence's theory of what he thinks has happened here, right? I understand why this is a story you, a story, an anti-gang activist shoots a guy at his own anti-violence rally. That seems like a story that a reporter should show up at or should ask some follow-up questions. As you start un unraveling it, what do you encounter? Well, <clears throat> I mean, it, it basically got more and more complicated the more I pulled, of course. So, you know, I, to, to start, and I, I told my students that were here, I see some of them, but yeah, I, 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 you know, I tried to uh, originally think, oh, this is a great magazine story. This is no, but it, 
basically it was like, I was like, I can't even tell this in a magazine. It's so complicated. Uh, but basically Terrence had been because he felt, and he told me from the beginning that he felt that he had become a target of a law enforcement effort. And he felt that he had been targeted because he had deci- he had ultimately come out uh, against a lot of the uh, things that were going on in the neighborhood. He had originally been actually really spearheading an effort that quickly had become recognized and funded by a number of major entities who were out from outside the computer community were white and those were the people who were getting paid positions and so forth and terrence meanwhile on the ground was also facing actually quite interestingly right before the shooting maybe six months before a computer repair shop opens in the holly okay and it's run by an og blood an older gang member blood, active blood, who Terrence knew well. And Terrence didn't uh, trust the place at all and felt that it was basically was a fed shop, uh, as they were saying, but they thought it was basically a place where informants were working and trying to lure in people and get information. And um, so that led to the, uh, there were basically the fires were burning all around and he uh, found himself kind of like a, like a, you know, a person with no home, like in his, in his neighborhood, he was just, you know, suddenly out and he had, and it got very dangerous uh, as, as, as it led up. And he believed that he was attacked for political reasons to remove him from his position. Essentially that so Terrence is doing anti-gang work at a time when there's a lot of state and federal money coming in for this type of work, where there are development and corporate interest in this area, uh, but what's gonna happen to Holly. And Terrence believes essentially that he's targeted, that he's set up um, to to be thrust back into violence in part because he's not politically convenient to the powers that be. Yeah, and you know, it was one of the reasons why I had to also go take the long view of this whole thing because it was at least obvious that what he was was someone who fit the mold of someone who had been in our history attacked or targeted for efforts that they were doing independently and in, in the community. We should, the last little screen there was like, a, a actually it was from Watts where there's a, a, a mural under the LA freeway says, nobody can stop this war but us. And it was the motto, so to speak, of the famous original truce of nine deuce between the Bloods and the Crips where they were tired of law enforcement dictating how efforts were going to go down in their neighborhood. And the reality is that for people like Terrence, and this is what's very hard, you know, we're at a time right now, as we all know, where violence is at all time highs, almost across America. It's the same in Denver. And the people who are dealing with it on the ground don't necessarily agree with, you know, how it's being funded or how it's being carried out. Well, Terrence was in the mold of those who felt it's better dealt with within the community. Now it's it's very complicated, but what we did see and what I did capture on camera and in the book um, is frankly the corruption of a federal anti-gang effort that replaced Terrence and sort of revealed a lot of how law enforcement and how Denver is deciding to deal with their problem and only gave more credence to everything Terrence said. And of course I spent as you mentioned, a long time digging into all of the sort of history that precedes it and what played out and ultimately did discover that Terrence was attacked on the day in question. He was attacked by gang members who have ties to law enforcement and that law enforcement, if didn't know it beforehand, definitely knew it afterhand. And if they didn't know it beforehand, we were talking before, that is straight out negligence because they were all over that neighborhood and it's, you know, people have been talking about, is there a new COINTELPRO? And we have plenty of examples or reasons to think there might be. And I think that this needs to be added to the list for consideration. How do you, how do you approach a story like this as a white guy, right? You're dropping into a historically black neighborhood in Denver. You're spending time, a lot of time with uh, black, local black residents and attempting to tell their story, and attempting to tell their story in a way that hasn't necessarily been told before. I mean, it was definitely the biggest challenge I've had as a reporter. Um, I never thought, you know, I'd done some 
dangerous stories overseas or complicated stories here and there and never thought that in my hometown of Denver, but what I would encounter, but sure enough. Yeah. So like I said, I mean, I came to it originally thinking, well, this looks like a really interesting story and I'm a trained journalist. This is what I do. Then of course I did, of course, start to think hard about and face situations, not only where actually, to be honest, during the reporting, I didn't really face the questions about being white. And later, in fact, I was told totally to my surprise that I was probably better off in that I was less likely to be an informant. Not that I couldn't be one, but that if I was a black reporter, and this is a sad thing, and we're going to get into some of that perhaps about the, just the level of infiltration of some of these communities and what it makes, what becomes of it. But I was not considered as likely. I was likely to be who I said, but um, I did immediately encounter what I did encounter actually was a distrust and a mistrust of the media, but because I was an independent journalist, what I found was very interesting was a, a community in which my allegiance was not only sought, but it was actually, at times it was like, as if it was a threat, like that I should be allied with one or another thing. And what I immediately also encountered, of course, and we discussed it, but like is the incredible divisiveness that does exist in African-American communities, particularly where they've been, tar they've been targets of law enforcement for so long, because you have so many kind of undercurrents mm. constantly, you know, manipulating the situation and people. So, but what I found worked, and this is what I did do, was that I actually um, had the luxury, Corey and I have talked about this, but of, you know, slow journalism and I didn't have to turn around a story the next day. And I, and I laid under the radar of the sort of like whatever. And I just got to know people and I just listened, listened, listened. And soon I found myself basically being also given a lot of information by a lot of people. And I just followed it and I just followed it and followed it. And ultimately the revelations in some ways that happen in the book. And they're a combination of, you know, sort of the shoe leather reporting and the kind of like investigative document digging. But some characters, frankly, ultimately revealed themselves to me. And that was, you know, an uneasy situation because I think that I know that there are, are people in the book who probably <laughs> definitely don't like it and probably regret maybe that they talked to me, but it wasn't because I did them wrong. It was because they revealed who they were to me and I reported it. What were, what was the relationship like and what were the complications of the relationship between the community and the Holly and law enforcement? Because there's a spectrum. Well, so, you know, one of the things I think is so important and, and, and should be known not only by journalists, but also like understood is, is that is two symbiotic relationships. And it's like, there is this interesting symbiotic relationship and historically has been between gang members and a community, gang members and social justice movements and gang members and law enforcement. And so gangs in a lot of communities have a significant cultural like part of that community bless this gang there's i mean all these posts and things and like i of course i was around and it's in the movie and it's in the book i, I mean i was around a lot of active gang members and and who i even liked you know but who i also the problem is that gangs do remain ultimately they are criminal organizations i'm not saying they're top down and that's actually something that law enforcement has tried to put on them but they're they're ultimately organizations that do get involved in criminal activity and they have significant political sway over communities for a number of reasons but one of them is fear one of them is the threat that they that they have and guess what they have found themselves to kind of be or those who have survived in it have, of course, secretly, um, you know, been at times so vulnerable to ultimately realize that, yeah, you know what, it might help me to be involved with law enforcement. And that is going on, and of course, goes on everywhere. And so that complicates a scenario in which you have an activist 
who might be wanting certain things and you have like community members who are involved in the gang, but they're, they're, I mean, in other words, the allegiances and the special interests are very complicated in these situations and they're volatile. Do you think the media coverage gets at that idea? Definitely not. <laughs> Why not? Um, uh, I've never seen it anyway. I think that it's a, probably a combination of factors, some of which we thought about, with, which we rather touched on rather, which is, you know, because of the way that media has gone and even, you know, the financial side of it, the Denver Post, for example, is owned by a hedge fund, as, as many of us know, and um, they've cut back and they don't have the resources because ultimately what it requires is a couple of things. One is, you know, the resources to actually go out there and make the connections and, and have the, the sources. But another thing that I want to really stress and we touched on it a bit, but is the long arm of law enforcement. And we're talking about a city like Denver, which has for decades been a regional hub of the FBI, the ATF, the DEA, the Homeland Security, and the Denver police who, I mean, I have, you know, it's funny because the sources that I have for this book are, are pretty close to, closer to a lot of the people who than they even know. But um, they're, are the, the Denver police and what they know is so far beyond even what sometimes, you know, people know, but people, other people are aware, but, but they have so much power and so much sway that they even are, let's remember where we are right now. And we can look backwards as well. And what happened, it's the same, the, the crackdown, the pushback, the blowback after something like a 2020 and like a George Floyd in the story, in the book, um, you may remember one of the other reasons why that the media doesn't always be able to get into that. So many of you know, we're in the Springs, but in Denver, Nine News, I think, considers herself the number one news channel. Well, throughout this process, the wife of an ATF agent in the middle of all of this stuff was covering criminal justice issues. I mean, to me, she's a law tool of law enforcement. And to go further, she was flirting with Terrence Roberts, calling him. I was there. I witnessed it. I mean, this is like, so it's not just you're running the law, oh, journalism in trouble. We have law enforcement planting people. We have law, we have major media organizations accepting people who are working with or for law enforcement. And then we wonder why the public doesn't understand these issues in the way that they could. There's it's multi-layered and, and, and problematic, but law enforcement there's a long arm and what's going on now needs to be really looked at harder than it is. You know, it occurs to me, having written about law enforcement at a local level and a national level, that very often the, when you look at coverage that misses the mark is, is insufficiently critical um, or investigative, very often it starts with an original sin, which is that the police or the law enforcement is the first call in the first place, right? That in, a, that in finding out what's going on with Terrence, there's a version you're gonna get from the police and there's a version you're gonna get from him that you get by spending all the time with him and tracking this down, right? How would you, I mean, this is a time of where, where I do think a lot of people across the industry are willing to be introspective and to think about how we might do things differently. What, from your reporting, do you think is applicable more broadly in terms of how should we be covering law enforcement in a community in a way that's different, right? We, we know that law enforcement remains one of the, the chief sources for a lot of the journalism that's being produced, very often the only source in some of these cases, right? We, I think it's easy to push back on that idea, but I think there's even more complex and more nuanced ways in which, uh, in, in which our, our coverage might still be open to further critique. Number one, though, I would say, yeah, and that's a big question and a great question. Number one, I think, uh, is to be more skeptical of certain sources. There's, uh, I came across people, there's high profile activists in Denver who are not who they say they are. There's people who are being funded by things who are the opposite of what they're trying, saying they're doing. There's so much, you know, special interests and sort of misinformation and 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 I have seen in Denver high profile uh, uh, sources and 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 people who've appeared as sources or or who are anonymous sources who are misdirecting things. That's number one. We need to be more skeptical of our sources and really look as as hard as we can into them. Which also means like sourcing more. Uh, people, which is also hard. And this is part of what, when we get to diversity, I, I'm a white guy, somehow manage this. Uh, but of course, like we need, we need more people of color who are 
in the community. Of course, I've had, as I think you know, I mean, I've had to deal with criticism. I've gotten hate mail from people like, how, who are you? You're not from the community. And then they list off 10 things that are happening in their community. I'm like, did you read the book? That's what the book is about. They're like, that's in the book. I'm like, that's what the book is about. So people are hating me in the book because I'm not from the community. It's not the only answer. In other words, like we need people of color, but we also just need people who are going to really look harder at those issues. And then I, I, and I think in general, what we also need to try to um, just do is, for example, we, we last week had in Denver uh, numbers put out uh, to one of our major news organizations claiming that there were zero uh, African-American gang homicides last year in, in Denver. And I haven't gone through all the numbers, but all I can say is that's the case. Denver has now suddenly gone from the most atrocious, horrific, like example of like fighting gang violence to literally solving it overnight the best ever so but like there seems to be no questioning of these numbers i dealt with numbers all the time from the police where it was clear that they were wrong were they yeah. purposely wrong i don't know i can't i'm not in their heads but there are various reasons why they could be wrong and i think we need to look hard and accept that here we are in america it's sad to say we always think data we're in an age of data guess what your Denver police official statistics might not be trustworthy and we need to think about it. Sure. Well, that's something I think about a lot. You know, when I was at the Washington Post, um, you know, did a lot of work around the collection and cleaning of police data, right? That we, we launched a fatal force database that looked at the number of fatal police shootings because the federal, uh, federal officials didn't keep that information. Uh, we followed up two years later and did a project called Murder with Impunity where we looked at unsolved homicides in neighborhoods um, and, and looking at the ways that was great, by the um, way, I love that. And, and looking at the ways that communities are underserved, not just by the presence of bad behavior by their police officers, but but by the the ways that they are not given justice and they don't receive justice. The black Americans are the most victimized, and yet they're the least likely to receive uh, a justice via our system. And how does that further delegitimize the system um, if it, if it can't deliver on its most basic promise to the people most likely to be victimized? Uh, but it is interesting as, as we did that work and as I thought about that, you, you know, so much of the, our understanding of the society we live in is based on the numbers and the statistics and the data. And yet that in, in the criminal justice space, uh, that, there, that we really are lacking a lot of the information we would need to truly understand what's going on in a place or what's happening, what that leaves is a void that can only be filled or is filled very often by these talking heads, these self-appointed folks by the police themselves. Um, and, and that it falls then to us as journalists to actually do the due diligence, to ask the follow-up questions, to drill in further. Um, and, and I think that, you know, I, I think very often the critiques of media are, are not even big ideological critiques, but rather like this reporting should have been better. You should have asked a follow-up question. You should have figured out who this person was. You shouldn't have taken this thing at face value, right? And that these aren't even necessarily these big sweeping clashes of, but that rather are, is this journalism pound for pound good enough? And if it's not, is that, is that doing a disservice to the people who are reading it? And I think that is, is such an interesting part of it as well. I mean, it really is. It, it's super complicated, like you say, because it's like you, it's like something seems better than nothing to some degree. I mean, you do need to start somewhere, and that's for sure. Um, I don't know. I mean, you're the one teaching the future of journalism. I'm kind of curious, what is the, you know, I mean, I told you how much I hate, I hate getting asked it because it's hard to answer. But I mean, what, because it does seem like new models are kind of necessary, because there is this legacy sort of model that, it, you know, even I, I, I dealt with it, I, I watched it in action at the post. I mean, when, when, um, uh, pieces were coming out. There were times when I was reporting on this story and the Denver Post was trying to get Terrence to comment and he wouldn't, and nor would others. And, I, and they would show it to, to me. They wouldn't talk to them because they had such mistrust and, and just dislike of, of how they'd operated. So, you know, is it like, I don't really know. I don't really know if, the, if they can recover from that or not. And if not, or even if they do, what is the way forward? Like, is there a, some sort of like hybrid system that can work? Sure. Well, and, I, and I think would also to build onto that question with a further question, right? Is this, is this idea of so much of the way that we cover communities and cover crime, cover any of these discussions is based on a prior business model. 
right, is based on the idea that the only way to get information is if we put that information, we write that information on pieces of paper and deliver it to your doorstep every morning at a certain interval, right? And it's the only way you can find out if there was a stabbing five blocks away, right? We, we know we don't live in that world anymore, right? In fact, our friend or our neighbor who's hyper obsessed with the crime blotter has the app and, is, and knows in real time about the stabbing, right? That we don't in fact need to drop it at his doorstep in the morning with very little of any information, right? And so how does that, how does the the further democratization of information that that the most basic information is broadly available the police department has its own twitter feed that if we wanted to know just what the police really said about an incident you now have access to that information in a way that previously you only would have gotten it via the television broadcast or through the newspaper i think that raises the question of what is our job as curators as vetters as investigators right um does that rate should that raise our, what our responsibility is, uh, because if someone just wants to know what the police have to say, they can find that. Yeah. They have access to that, right? What does it mean that when we then codify it and putting it under our byline or in a, on our newspaper or on our front page, um, oftentimes without having had the time to figure out what is true and what is not, right? And I think that that is one of the, you know, we talked about this, the students and I talked about this a lot in our block, right? We talked a lot about this idea of how do we, who, who do we trust and how do we trust, them, right? And how, how do we know that this information works and is valid? And I think that one thing that stood out to me in conversations with them was they all, they all everyone wants trustworthy news, but we're hit with the diluge of untrustworthy news at all times. We're like open Facebook on our phone right now and the first of the first seven links, five of them are gonna be nonsense, right? And, and yet that is what we're encountering most often. And, and and so how do we, and you have just actual junk, you have things that are not true, you have things that are incomplete, right? Or, or that, that are, that again, are such a nub, are so short, are lacking so much information that, that it might as well not be credible because you just don't know, it doesn't tell you anything. And I think that that, I think that's one of our key questions on something in, in a world where, where information is available at our fingertips. What is our responsibility as a publisher, as a platform, as a journalist? to really figure out the answers to the questions before we hit the button, right? It was different back when we just gotta get this in the paper today and by tomorrow we'll figure out, but we don't live in that world anymore, yeah. right? That, that, and so to what extent do we become, and it's a, it's a push and pull and I think different places do it differently. At what extent do we stop being the quote unquote paper of record, meaning everything that happened iteratively appeared in our newspaper, right? There was a stabbing yesterday. Today, we found out who got stabbed two days ago. Well, today, that person, and, it, and to what extent do we lean from that? And at what extent do we say, all right, here's the definitive piece about what actually happened last Tuesday. We've had time to reach everyone and talk to everyone and call everyone. And you know that when you encounter this, it's real. Right? I mean, it, it, what's hard about it is that in, in, a, in a funny way, of course, originally social media and citizen journalism was a way to sort of democratize mm -hmm. right, the field. And now... It's so obviously also a way to <laughs> distort <laughs> everything. And um, so, yeah, I mean, I think that it would be great to find a, a, a way that, that more accountability and contextualizing is happening in real trained journalism and can try to sort of maybe in, in some ways, and it might be honestly with new, and there are obviously, God, in the last 10 years, how many new, you know, major, you know, news organizations have, have, have come up um, that never existed before. So, I mean, I, I think there's a chance, but it does feel like, I mean, just like there's the discussions obviously about uh, how to deal with uh, the police and, and, and what should be done it seems like we're, we're really facing it on that level in journalism as to, you know, do you tear it up and start over? Or do you, do you try to build, can the Philadelphia Inquirer make its reclaim some sort of, well, a reclaim or ever claim a trust with certain communities that it hasn't had, or is it beyond that? Is, does there, I mean, all I know is that um, in Denver, it seems to, it, it serves uh, the voices that remain just like in America, uh, the more powerful continue to be well served by failures in the media. The stories you tell in the Holly, the people you talk about are not necessarily people who get covered uh, with much nuance, with much complexity, which must, with, with much length. 
um, you, you talk about it as like an invisible member. And I know there's been some debate about whether or not that's the appropriate term or if it should be or how, but what, what do you make of that, uh, of that framing and of that conversation about yeah. whether, how the stories of that part of Denver are told or are not told? I mean, you know, so what, yeah, what, it's interesting. One thing that, that, that happened after the book um, came out, one of my best reviews in a way was in the New York Times. And then there was a comment you know, from the reviewer, very esteemed uh, uh, scholar, Marsha Chatelain, uh, won the Pulitzer Prize last year and reviewed the book and liked it and, and also kind of dinged me about the fact that I called uh, the community, I referred to it at times as an invisible Denver. And I'm open and been, have, you know, taken my shots on these kinds of things. But, uh, you know, what was interesting to me is that the characters, you know, you start to have to get to that point. I'm sorry, they're the people, I should say. As I've talked to my classes, by the time you're writing, you have to have everything. It's like you have to get into that mode. But these are the people I dealt with said to me, we are Invisible Denver. Actually, literally one of the uh, people who blurbed the book who lives there and is a historic family from there called them Invisible Denver. And when the review came out, I was getting calls saying, who is this racist white woman who reviewed your book saying we're not invisible? I was like, well, actually, she's an African-American Pulitzer Prize winning historian. And she thought it was bad that I called you that. They're like, what are we? And I remember just thinking, well, I mean, if they're not invisible, why is that what's happening to them happening? I mean, it continues and continues over the years that this community disproportionately by far ends up sending their community to the prisons, to the, to the cemetery at young ages um, is, I mean, the, the, the PTSD in the community that, I mean, it's just, I mean, the gentrification now, all of these things happen, call it what it is, but they're not getting the actual visibility that is real, yeah. you know, is not showing up. And of course, you know, it's hard because like, uh, especially as a white journalist, there's, I feel like it's just a, land, a minefield rather. And I don't, I'm trying, I don't want to use any terminology that, that offends anyone, but I feel like there is a problem with the fact that this is not understood in the way that it should be. And how can it be? And part of the failure, of course, the fourth estate of journalism is supposed to be to inform the public. And this is one reason I do believe that these problems continue is because people don't, I mean, throughout this story, I've had just so many people not, who are caring, who are smart, who wanna understand their community, not realize uh, what is going on. Hmm. So to some, there's a something is missing. <laughs> there's a, Something's not missing. Yeah. Um, and, it, and not to say it's easy because it's frankly, it, it's, it's, even dangerous at times. I mean, I felt that it was dangerous. I was threatened. I was, it was suggested that by digging into certain things or divulging certain things that it would be potentially dangerous. And I had people who are, you know, well-known people getting public money who are, you know, in the right way so that there's plausible deniability, but they're threatening me, mm -hmm. you know? And, um, this is the world we live in. And I think it's for most Americans and people in Colorado or Denver, they're like, isn't that like another country? No, it's not. Mm. Should we go to questions? Yes, Lynn. Just repeat the question a little. Sure. Bit. Yeah, yeah. You know, so so I mean, the core of the question is is this idea is that you know, is it possible working within the industry, working within the institutions, the media institutions, to do this type of reporting that gets to a level of independence and gets to a level of um, and gets to this level of depth. You know, this is something the students and I talked about a lot. Right? Was this idea of um, what are the realities of the institution of media? Whether that be what is their what is in their corporate and financial interests, what is the what are the literal logistical publication realities 
uh, of what of what happens. Uh, do we have three days for this story or do we need to do this today? And how does that change uh, the quality of the story? Because as you know, we all, all of us would take an extra two days on every story, right? Like, and so, and, and what are the trade-offs and the push and pull there? You know, I, I think that there is, look, I, I, I think there are a lot of people working in journalism who are doing a lot of really good work and doing it within institutions. But, but I do think that, but I do think we make a mistake when we pretend as if there is not some level of trade-off. Right. When you work within the institution, you receive a level of resource, a level of support. You've got a lawyer, you've got someone who can copy you. You're receiving a level of structural support. And yet with each additional person, that's an additional person's sensibility you've added into it. You've got to factor in what, their, what, what they might find compelling or not find compelling, their ideas of what the story is or is not. The fact that they, they may now be drained or stretched in different areas. And so they may be able to, as opposed to the individual who is just like, all right, this is the thing I'm obsessed about, I'm working on and I'm pushing through, right? Um, and so I think that, like I said, I, I, don't, I don't think it's true that it's impossible to do this type of work via the institutions. Although I do think it's important to understand the limitations and the limiting factors of the institution. I'd also be interested, to Julian, you know, because I also think there's a difference sometimes too in being on staff at an institution like this where you are liable for the hamster wheel that is the institution producing itself versus being able to actually be in the bunker and working on the thing, um, right? And, and, and so I certainly know of work like this that gets published at major institutions. Although in some cases, it's by people who bring it to the institution, not that the institution itself thinks of this idea and works it out and then gives someone the space and the resources to do it. I think it cuts in both directions. Yeah, I mean, I think it's, uh, and by the way, thanks, that's Lynn Clark, the chair of the <laughs> University of Denver Film, Media and Journalism program, and thanks for coming. And um, I, um, I think it's a really interesting challenge. I think that I hope anyway, there's a way that they can kind of both work together in their own ecosystems because they're different. And the reason is, and it, it, it's kind of like working a beat versus not, because working a beat, you do have to deal with certain things that I didn't have to do with, deal with, mm -hmm. which was a luxury for me. Because I, I mean, I, I, I kept my word. I, I did what I said. I was who I was. I, I took the calls. I made the calls. But if you're working every day, either as a daily reporter or you're on TV or whatever, you know, you need that contact at the police who's going to like be like, here's this or you have that. And if you and, and there's a trade off. I mean, yeah. un, unfortunately, that's the reality. I mean, that's how life works. And there are a lot of people in, you know, and, and this is why, for example, especially like in a place like Denver right now, where the police have a lot of power because they can hand out a story here or there to, to people. And I watched it. I watched when there was like just a doozy of a story that I was like watching or sitting right under and the reporters were getting sent right down onto another one. Quick, look at that. And it was all on the news about this. And this one was just sitting there, mm -hmm. just no one looking at it. And uh, so there's way there's, and, and I'll just say that, you know, what we all have to remember and know, and it's a resource question, of course, but politics, there's a lot of money, there's special interests, there's a lot of players involved. And I mean, they, they're, they're, they're not stupid. I mean, they're, 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 they, they're strategic actually. And so I think journalists need to understand that and try to be strategic themselves and not, I mean, I don't know. I mean, I've had the luxury for a long time now of not being a beat reporter. So it's, I don't know what you would say, Wesley. I mean, how did you feel when you, did, were you, I made a, here's the thing with me and this project, I kind of made a decision early on for two reasons. One, I realized that the story I was working on was the type of story that's typically told by law enforcement sources. And I was like, you know what? I want to kind of do it inside out. But number two was that I didn't have, <clears throat> you know, that kind of burden. And when the, pol and I actually tried, I did try early on. I was like, there was one particular police commander who's featured in, in the book and I knew him and he knew me and he in the movie, he tries to throw our camera over and, and, you know, he didn't want anything to do with me after handing me his card and telling me how happy he was to talk to me and they're a model for the nation. As soon as he realized that I realized that I understood too much, he wanted nothing to do with me. So did you in your reporting or how do you deal with that? 
when, I mean, I've found any way that like the same guy would be happy to talk to Nine News because he knows they're not going to ask him any of it. They're like, oh, chat, chat, chat. But I might throw something at him he doesn't want to talk about. Yeah, I think in, in my experience covering law enforcement, like I said, it, it, it's been unique in part because I've done the majority of it at the national level. And what that's allowed me to do is it allows me not to be beholden to the same daily uh, logistical relationships yeah. that a local reporter needs to have that, that I, I had to have when I was covering these things locally. Um, but it allows me to come in very often and ask questions at a level that are higher. And, and also, by the way, to, to lean back in that local media has done a bunch of iterative reporting and able to go back and say, okay, on Tuesday, people said that this was true. By Wednesday, they were saying this, which is it? How do we correct the record? How do we figure out what's going on? And I, I think the other thing for me that I think about is you know, I don't think about these always as law enforcement stories, right? I think about these as stories of people in in their lives, right? I think that we, I think we can get into the collective we in journalism, we can become so reliant on the official sources, in part because they're easier to get to. They've got a spokesperson who you can call. It's a lot harder to track down that guy who was there and figure out what happened. Right, but but what do we miss when we don't do it? I, I mean, I, I, the example I use and think about is, you know, most of us, if not all of us, have seen the George Floyd video, and a piece written that night on the law enforcement statement would have misled your reader as to what happened. It'd be much more difficult journalism to go find the thirty witnesses who were there, but now we know who they all are, and they all videotaped, and they all had there were thirty different sources who could have told you what happened that day. And yet in Minneapolis, there was not a single reporter who was finding those sources. They were all writing what law enforcement had to say. Uh, You know, I I, I think we can accept as a premise the difficulty of the job, how quickly things are moving, how hard it can be, the fact the information that these are communities very often where there are such eroded, if ever existent relationships. And yet on stories of literal life and death, we should go knock on some doors, right? And, and what is the consequence if we don't? How, how, does, how does the setting- We're seeing it. <laughs> right, what is the setting in, in motion, the narrative that ends up not being true? What are the cases that we didn't all investigate because we all believed what the police said day one and there wasn't video. And so no one ever went and found the 30 witnesses. What happens if there's not video there? It's not that there's not a bunch of independent witnesses who could have said what happened. It's would we have ever bothered to go find them? And if not, would there have been a massive injustice that would have happened on our collective watch, in our society, in our culture, without us having probed it, right? In a city, the Twin City, in, in, in an area that is a major media market with lots of reporters, with lots of journalists, right? And so I think that that is a really big part of it as well. I think about, I got a friend, a former colleague at the Post, John Cox, he does a lot of coverage of gun violence, uh, school shootings specifically. And I, he said that we were on a panel once together. I was talking about police violence. He was talking about gun violence. And I steal this line from him where he talks about, he goes, you know, a lot of journalists aspire or they want to be the first person to get to a story. And what he said is, I want to be the last person to write about a story. Because the last person who writes, it gets the story right. And, and, and I think that, you, you know, and, and, I, and I think that there is something for, I, I think, especially, again, especially at a time where a lot of our readers don't trust the link they're encountering. They know that a lot of things are half-baked or not, although there's a lot of value in saying, let's really look at this and find out what actually happened. And let's take the time to do it. And if you read one piece, it should be this one on this question or on these issues, right? And, and I, I think that I think it's a reason that places like the Times and the Post have seen spikes in subscriptions. I think it's places, the reason why places like the New Yorker, or NPR, right, e- even despite everything happening in the industry, are still relatively strong in what they're doing. Because I know when I click on a New Yorker link, what I'm getting. I know they called all the people. I know they've tried to track down the folks, right? I, I know when I listen to 25 minutes of the NPR, I know I'm getting it. And, and I think that at a time where the average, the quality of the average news report is perhaps lower. There's a premium on the report that actually does the job. And so I think for those of us who think of ourselves as as serious journalists, I think it only adds to our responsibility to make sure we made all those phone calls and got all that information. Uh, I really enjoyed the the conversation, gentlemen. Thank you. I, so I actually I do have a couple of questions, and uh, and 
that, that I'd like to, to challenge a couple of the things you said, Wesley, uh, uh, respectfully. I, I can take it. Sorry. Oh, I, no, I'm sure. I'm sure. <laughs> Let's go. Uh, so sort of. A I'm, I'm out of here. Never mind. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Let's take this up back. Uh, kind of a three pronged uh, question. The first one to when when I hear hear you talking about uh, the the iterative nature classically of journalism, comparing it to today, and as you point out, most information that would have classically been in news reports can be found through other resources. The implication being that it should be on journalists here to to be able to take the next step. Mm -hmm. How do you square that with, well, okay, the first thing I would say is that as far as there being information on other sources like the police station or the, excuse me, the police department has a Twitter account. But does the typical audience member actually go out and look for that? Mm -hmm. You know, are they scanning through to go look for all the firsthand sources themselves to kind of collect that information for themselves to distill and and bring their own truth and then find the real truth in the Mm -hmm. newspaper article? I would argue that most people don't. And what most people do is that they're, they're looking through Facebook or whatever and looking for articles from, you know, somewhere. And so is it not still advantageous to have that iterative daily journalism from local organizations who are doing it in the way that has been always done as as flawed and iterative as you say it is, Mm -hmm. because it still is better than hearing from Larry, the guy down the street that he said that the police told him this and that. And and the reason and the reason I ask that as a bit of a challenge is just that with say especially young journalists starting out getting into newsrooms where there is more responsibility with fewer resources and fewer people how do we square that because we all don't get to start at, we all don't get to work at the washington post you know what i mean certainly yeah and even everyone who works at the washington post doesn't really get to work at the washington post depends right. on, you know it's, sure it's that, sure that, that, that there's different based on kind of the what that framing right I think I'd say a few things. I think the first is that um, I think the greatest value of the iterative reporting is to the reporter doing it because it forces them to ask the follow-up question. Sure. Right. And, and that, and that sometimes, you know, there's a privilege to come back in after the fact and take advantage of the existence of all this iterative reporting and start piecing it together. Right. And I think we have to acknowledge that without that existence, that job becomes more difficult. Right. Um, that said, I, I think there's, I think the bigger question there, right, to the concept of how we do the iterative reporting, what it looks like, how it, right, and I don't necessarily know the answer to it, and I could propose one, but I think there'd probably be few, is someone stabbed in South Nevada tonight, right now, right? How urgent of the news is that? Do people really need to know that? Hmm. Like in a real, I mean, and, I, and I'm just asking, right? Like, uh, in most cases, this is not an actual public safety threat. The person who is going to be stabbed is already stabbed. It happened, right? This is not a mass shooting event or a, you know, mm-hmm. that that there becomes this question. I, I think there's an open question. And again, where I might draw the line might be different than when someone else does. And I think that each outlet probably would make different decisions on this, right? But what actually is the news? And at a time when previously there was literally no way to know someone had been stabbed on South Nevada Mm -hmm. unless the newspaper writes it, I think there's a clear and obvious argument for why that's the news, even in an iterative fashion, even if we don't know the name of the person yet, right, which most of those reports wouldn't have. I think the question becomes today, at a time where there are more firsthand sources, the person who watched the stabbing is posted on Facebook, where there is a crime watch blog, I can sit and listen to the scanner myself if I so desire, right? It's, it's the sense of the hyper-engaged person can find the information. And does it matter that my mom is now not disproportionately scared of South Nevada because of a stabbing that was never going to impact her at all, hmm. right? That, that, like functionally, how urgent is this information for my audience to know? Especially in a form in which we don't even know the name of the stabbed guy, right? That the iterative work so often is so lacking in the detail and the information. And, and, I, and again, I, I think that I don't know that the answer is to do none of it. But I, 
my gut would suggest that the answer is is not where we are. Yeah, well, I well, I thought it was so interesting that you said, and what really struck for me was that idea where you compared where it was, where we see a lot of bad journalism versus seeing a lot of incomplete journalism. Yeah, and and I thought that was that 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 really hit the nail on the head. But I also see this that journalism by its very nature can't be anything other than incomplete and that these things become more complete as as time goes on and so i i think that is an interesting question the way you pose it is um to what degree at what level does your audience need to know about something at some point yeah and and what Um, and and again and and i also accept that sometimes the way you get to the bigger story is by covering the story in an iterative right. fashion, right? Uh, but like I said, I do think there is a. Que- I think there's an open question about yeah, when do we need to know what what amounts to news? When do we need to know it? How complete does it need to be? And to what extent does in in what extent does some of this drive right? A time when there is when a piece that I publish anywhere can go all around the world in a moment and can and can fuel a conspiracy theory, can do it. Th- at what point is it? Does it become so imperative that we be half a step more complete before yeah. we hit the button, right? In, in a real way, right? Not not to disparage the person who hits the button a step earlier than I might have, but it's a real question of when information can travel this way mm-hmm. and can fuel whatever and can be whatever and can undercut the trust in the institution or build the trust up in the. How important is it for us to get get three more details or double confirm that how important is it for our first draft to be a half a step less messy? Yeah. Well, it, it seemed, Julian, you seem to have touched on this just to, just to touch too. And I wonder if you reflect on journalism history a little bit, that to what degree does earlier incomplete reporting that's more incomplete then Wesley might argue is appropriate, does more harm than good when it comes to something like justice or say the social justice sure. component of, of stories. Well, things become understood to be true just because they've existed once, twice, the more they're said, of course, the more they're sure. accepted. And of course that does happen. And that's that's actually it is a really dangerous and problematic thing. And of course, because people shaping those stories are often people who are authority figures in some way. So they have additional, whereas sometimes the truth of a story might be in the most, you know, powerless people. And that's what I find to be, you know, the most obviously, you know, missing. And, 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 and that's why it's so hard because I mean, as Wesley said, and as we're all discussing, it's like, it is a lot of like legwork, so to speak. Right. And then there's the, 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 the uh, pressures of the, of the industry or like who's getting the story out first. So, yeah, I think there, A, needs to be, yeah, more probably consideration about what stories are, are getting put out, B, consideration of the sources and reconsideration of the sources and vetting of those sources. And then just, I mean, as much as possible, like really trying to, because I've just, I, I mean, certainly in, 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 in the book I've done, I, I mean, I, I found some of the best sources to be by far the most powerless, uh, you know, and, and like, you know, unexpected people who are never going to otherwise talk to the media, be asked of anything by the media, easily discredited, et cetera. And yeah. hard to find and, a lot and, of times. And that takes time and it takes resource. And it, yeah, I, the other thing that occurs to me as I'm thinking about it, and I, I, I just appreciate these questions. I think there's, there's a smart line of, of thinking around it, right? Um, it, you know, I, I think about, you know, I, I had the privilege at the Post and, and elsewhere of working for various different desks, um, but of working for you know, national politics and local, and then moving over to investigate. Right, and, and there's something that's interesting that comes with that because and I joke about this when my best friends is still at the Post as well, the politics reporters, nothing he publishes could have gotten through the investigative desk. Nothing, none of it. 
sourcing <laughs> isn't good enough. The they didn't follow up and ask this question. They didn't right that. And, and, and so what I wonder, and so again, I, I I think about it, and I'm in a position of privilege where I largely at this point do investigations, longer projects, big enterprise pieces where I can treat all of them like this, right? Well, yeah, no, you're not mentioning my piece unless I knocked on your door to try to find you, right? Like because what's interesting is the reader doesn't know that, right? right. The but reader the reads them both piece, the same. There's none of that. It just is. It's it, it moves more quickly than that, right? And and that, and I and I and I. The, what I would challenge us is that what would it look like if all of our pieces had to be five had to be five percent more like they were coming through investigative, right? And how would that how would that prevent us from laundering official narratives that end up not being true? Would it mean that we do knock on some doors and get some people who we just? It, I, I think that sometimes we we go through the motions and don't fully do the work because we don't expect the work to work. We're, we know we have to move so quickly, so we can't get this person or we can't. I remember I was telling a story. I was, I was just retelling the story yesterday. I was talking to one of my old editors and I remember being in Ferguson during the demonstrations after Michael Brown's death. And there was a night where the activists uh, did a sit-in outside of a gas station and they all sat down and the cops came in and used their light sticks to break them up and do, you know, and arrest them. So all these people get arrested. And the police go, and at the time, you know, I was the on the ground reporter for the post, and I had another colleague comes to really close with she, she would come in during the morning and piece everything together uh, based on all my feeds I'd send in at like 6 a.m. And and in this particular day, the police do a press conference at 6 a.m. or 7 a.m. and they say, look, we you know, yeah, we arrested two dozen people at this gas station, they were throwing rocks at us, it got hyper violent, the cops were being threatened. Well, and so she kind of writes it straight and incorporates my feet and sends me a read back. And I'm like, no, that, none of that happened. Like I was standing there. No one was throwing any rocks. I was there. It didn't happen. Well, that's what the cops say. What are we supposed to do? Like, well, I was there. What are we supposed, what are we supposed to do? And, and so I, I call, um, and so I go, let me, let me call. A so, I, so, I, so I go to the St. Louis, the city of St. Louis police. I go, hey, I, I saw the, the press conference, saw what you guys had to say about people throwing rocks. Uh, you know, maybe I just missed it, uh, but I, you know, I was out there all night. I don't think that's what prompted the arrest to happen by standing there. And the initial response from the spokeswoman is, well, this unquestionably happened. So in fact, the police chief himself was struck by a rock. And I said, well, I said, that's, that's remarkable. <laughs> Do you have a photo of the rock uh, taken as part of the investigation into the assault on the police chief of the city of St. Louis? Surely, if the police chief was struck by a rock, you all are investigating that as a crime. Oh, never mind. Actually, a rock landed kind of near his feet. He wasn't <laughs> hit. In, in, two email, in two sentences of on-the-record exchange, we go from them accusing someone of a, 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 of a serious felony against the police chief, it was remarkably incendiary event, to acknowledging that, like, all right, none of this really even happened anyway. It was two emails. Like, it wasn't a, right? Like, it wasn't a, it was like the most basic pushback I ever could have provided. Like, hey, I like, happen to be standing there. I don't think that happened. You know, but, but so often the speed with which we all have to work, and I'm very sympathetic to this. I'm not, like, it's not a, means we don't ever go, so do you have a photo of the rock? Right, like we just said, well, the police say the police chief was struck with a rock. Well, if the police chief was struck with a rock, did they take the rock into evidence? Right, like if so, I want to see the rock. And I think that that becomes the, the example, you know. Well, the story was told for decades. You might remember from the book that in the, the, the peak of the civil rights movement in Denver in 1968, this incident was supposedly this young man at the Holly shot a police officer. But in all of my research, including both, you know, documents as well as like interviews with the family and people who were there, it's pretty clear there was, this officer was never shot. And in fact, the guy didn't even have a real gun, but it, I don't know of any evidence until my book came out that challenged that. That's 1968. It's the biggest event in Denver's civil rights history. It was completely misreported based on erroneous, false uh, you know, presentation by the police chief, and it, it becomes the balance. It, it's it's the push. It's the push and pull between how much of what we do is about reporting what has what people are saying and what they say happening, and how much of it is investigating what they say. 
right? The example, uh, you know, and so it's, it's figuring out how much are we supposed to be stress testing what people say versus how much are we supposed to be relaying what they say, right? It is accurate that the police department says the rocks were thrown at them, right? I can write that and not, it's not wrong. They did say it. But where is my push and pull between what is my obligation? Because my reader wasn't there. What is my obligation to figure out what is true before I hit the button? And, and, I, and I accept as a premise, that's a messy proposition. We're not always going to be able to get to the answer to that question. What I might suggest, though, is that to the extent to which we are inclined the other way, a lot of it is because of just the actual logistics of how we used to produce. This story actually doesn't need to be done by 5 p.m. We can wait till tomorrow morning to figure out if there was a rock and if they have a photo of it, <laughs> right? Like it doesn't, we can wait, we can wait all day for the photo of the rock, right? And like, and so there's some, I think there's some of that. Uh, I think I, I would just challenge us all collectively to like, if we could be 5% more that way, what, what might that save us um, in terms of reporting things that end up not being true, laundering narratives that then collapse, you know? The last thing I want, and I'm look, I'm horrified of it. One day, 20 years from now, some reporters are going to go, hey, you wrote this thing in 2024 or, or 2014, and now that the whole thing has played out, none of that was true, right? And I think we have to be, I think we have to be cognizant of that, right? That the said in something we're saying doesn't mean that that's true, <laughs> right? And we don't want to let people just say whatever, without stress testing it a little bit, because if it ends up all not all being false later, we've got a big problem, right? Doing a lot of criminal justice reporting, we see, I see this a lot. Uh, we're in an age of exonerations, right? We have a whole, we, we've got a whole generation of people who are now being released from prison after 30 and 40 years, tied up, caught up in the 90s, right before DNA evidence, but at a time when we were freaking out about crime rates going up and we wanted higher clearance rates and arrest the people and super predators. And now we're finding out that we got all these people locked up who didn't do the thing we accused them of. And what I would say is in a lot of those cases, there are newspaper reports that declare pretty definitively that this person did this murder, did this thing, did, that advanced the prosecutor's narrative or advanced the police officer's narrative, right? Where we start becoming a little lackadaisical about the saids and according tos and the, right? And, and, I, and I would just, again, I, I would just suggest that I think we just want to be careful with all those things, right? We got to be really careful about what we know and what we don't know. And I think that the feedback we get from readers very often is that at times we are overconfident. We state a thing and it ends up not quite. Li- and then when you get the after action, well, that was way more nuanced to that. Did the guy really, t- and that cuts in every direction politically on all these issues, right? But I do think that it's the sense of like, if, if journalism is the humble pursuit of as much of the story as we can find, we can build some more of that humility into the pieces itself. Sometimes the humility is waiting another day because we don't, because I'm not confident enough with what I want to publish that I want it published yet. And other times it's saying, look, this, we really don't know, or there is a dispute here, or here, this is what we don't know. And I think we could do more of that. I think. Um, Wesley, what was um, your experience working with the Marshall Plot Project and specifically working within prisons? Sure. Uh, so, yeah, so I'm a contributing editor at the Marshall Project, which is a nonprofit news organization covering uh, criminal justice. And um, I primarily came on, I've been working with them for this uh, second year, I've been working with them. Um, they are beginning to expand into local uh, media and to start and launch local newsrooms. And one of their first expansions is in Cleveland, which is my hometown. And so I was talking to the leadership of the Marshall Project about something else. And they were mentioning this to me. And I said, actually, you know, I've I'm pretty well sourced there. I know some folks um, and there are some ideas about how what a local news organization might look like on these issues. And so we began this reporting um, to try to get uh, criminal court data uh, from Cuyahoga County, which is the county in, including and surrounding Cleveland. And one of the things I'm interested in with court data, having done a lot of criminal justice data work, is that the courts are a bit of a black hole in our criminal justice system. They are ostensibly public. You can walk in and sit down and listen to what happened, but, but it's like Snapchat, it disappears, right? <laughs> what actually happened in court today, there is not a written record of. It was public, you could have been there and found out what happened, but if you weren't, you don't know. And, and because of that, 
uh, we, we see this uh, in Cleveland. Um, Ohio is one of the states that has elected judges. And so, um, and so that lack of information made it almost impossible to fully gauge the records and reputations of the judges there. So this is something we've made democratic. People get to vote for the judges, and yet we've built a system where they can't actually know anything about how this judge compares to this other judge. And so what we began doing is we, we built this really comp like complicated data scraping system where we pull, where we basically have extracted case by case all the information we can out of the justice system so we can begin sorting and understanding, okay, this judge sends, sends people charged with theft to prison 27% of the time compared to this judge who sends people. And it's all complicated. It's hyper anywhere in each case, case by case, but it's been a, a real, you know, so we published our first piece in that series. It was two weeks ago now, right? Where it was right when I first got out here. And a big part of what we're working on, what the team has been working on. And again, I, I'm a small part of a, a much larger team on this is trying to, make this information as accessible as possible to the people who can most benefit from this information. Uh, my class and I talked a lot about what the local news bundle used to exist of, right? And those, a nerd like me, I thought that if I worked for a paper that had 20,000 circulation, 20,000 people are reading my report on the city council meeting last night. Two people were reading my report on the city council <laughs> meeting. It was me and my mom, right? Like no one else, right? Now, 20,000 people might've been checking to see the Red Sox score, they might have been checking for the weather, what's gonna happen this weekend, can they go skiing or can they not? They might, be, they might need to buy a car or sell their house, so they were checking the classifieds, they might need a distraction during work or during a boring discussion, so they're doing the Sudoku, the crosswords, right? But what we, and so what I think part of the challenge facing us in media now is how do we replace that local bundle? Some of those things are coming back, right? You're, you're not, the newspaper is never gonna replace your iPhone weather app right? That we're not going to convince you to buy the newspaper to get the weather, right? It's not, it's not coming back. And there was literally a time where that was one of the reasons you would subscribe. We're not going to convince people to come back to get the sports scores. Because if you care, you already got them, right? You, you know, it, but, but there's a question of what can we bundle? What are the public services we can do uh, that might uniquely exist here? And so what we've done with this Cleveland project is we've thought a lot about how do we get this information about the court system to the most affected people? And we tried to flip the way we do the work on its head. Traditionally, we would come in, I would write some 10,000 word piece and all my like obnoxious journalists and friends would be like, this is such a great written piece. And they'd all tweet it and blah, blah, blah. But if my target audience for the information contained in the piece are people who are living in the city of Cleveland, a city with a 40% literacy rate, a bunch of New Yorker pieces isn't going to give them that information. By the way, they don't subscribe to New York or wherever, right? And so what we thought about was like, how do we present this information in ways that are accessible, that gets to people? So we partnered with a bunch of local media organizations. It appeared in the Alt Weekly. It appeared on the NPR affiliate. It appeared on the Black radio station. It appeared in the Black paper. And we gave the journalism to everyone. You could have it, reproduce it. We hired a local cartoonist to make animations. And because the thought was, we're doing this journalism because we want to put this information in the hands of people and, and have it be essential information for them. I think that so often, again, this goes back to what I was saying earlier, so much of what we do in journalism is, is pure habit. We've always done it this way, so this is how we're going to keep doing it, right? Despite the fact that our industry and our society has been completely disrupted since, the, <laughs> since we started doing it this way. And, and so that's, and that's not to say you throw everything out or get rid of all of it, or, but it's this question of like, all right, what is the best way to tell this story? What is the best, who are the people who need this information? How do we make sure they get this information? And so uh, it's been really interesting at the Marshall Project to kind of work through this, this Testify project, which like I said, we got the first piece out, we've got some other stuff we're working on still. And this thought of, this is an information hole. The community deserves information about its elected judges and its elected officials. And we have the resources and the ability to get that information. And we also have the creativeness to be in community with the community to figure out how they need to get it. Not doing it in the way we think is cool, <laughs> but in the way, but how do we actually get this information to them? And so I think that that, I think that part of it is really, really important. Um, I, like I said, I think that to the extent to which the criminal justice system is one of our major um, institutions, 
there's so much information we don't have, so much we don't know, and there's so much power for media institutions. And again, it's not even a particular agenda other than that people have the right to know the information. Do with it whatever you want to do with it. Maybe you conclude that the judges aren't sending enough people to prison, so you vote for someone else because of it, right? But we should know the answer to the question. And I, and I, think, that that's, I think that's kind of the underpinning and the ideology behind a lot of the work we do. Hey, Wes, um, question for you. And this is kind of that one of those journalistic, idealistic questions. So. Sure. Um, but, you know, I, I kind of I'm listening to you guys and I wonder if you see progress, if you see progress in journalism from these reckonings, from these reiterations of journalism. And, you know, it's sort of a question about race relations, too. Yeah. I mean, we've had this sort of upheaval and now I see some reaction to that, especially in Denver. But do you see progress here? Do you think there's, you know, we, we did see videos of George Floyd and people reacted to him and there was, you know, um, s- some movement from that. Yeah. Some reforms from that in Denver, particularly. I, I just wonder, you know, if you see all of that leading to something, progress, or you're still very skeptical about, you know, how this country looks at race and, and looks at you know some of these uh, communities of color. You know, I, I think for me, I, you know, I'm, you know, I, I end up being or I end up coming across sometimes pessimistic, but it's it's pessimism as a means of being optimistic. I think that the more I think the more honest we are about how deep the problems are is the only way we can solve them, right? And so it's not to talk about how bad it is just because oh it's so bad it's like no no but the sooner we get to the sooner we understand that the sooner we can address it. um you know <laughs> to answer the question in the media context um you know i just did this piece in the philadelphia inquirer and, and one thing that's interesting is that we're in a moment in the media that is very that is one we've been at before mm-hmm. right that the mainstream american media is in its third reckoning the first is in the 50s and the 60s where it realizes, oh, wait, we don't employ any black people. How are we going to how are we going to cover any of civil rights? Right. Uh, much less, you know, much less the urban riots or what's going on. You have these stories of so many of the first black newspaper journalists in, in major uh, mainstream news organizations who were working as the receptionist or the security guards when a riot happened and the white reporters were scared to go to the neighborhood. And so they said, hey, you can you go over there and tell us what's happening? And there are cases in LA and other places where you have, you have some of the first black journalists to ever win Pulitzer Prizes were drafted into their paper's coverage and they were not journalists. They were just the closest black guy who they, you could send to Watts, right? And, and, and so that's the 50s and the 60s where the newspapers realize that they journalistically cannot avoid the story that is civil rights and that they cannot, and they, and they understand they clearly cannot cover it without having any black voices in the room or in the conversation. You get to the you get to the '90s, uh, where once again outside pressure uh, via uh, another round of rioting, the Rodney King videos in '91, right? Another moment just like this, Congress is passing uh, um, police reform legislation, um, and so you have external outside pressure at a time when also politically there was pressure around the idea of affirmative action, right? And so it was this ex- so the liberal institutions across the United States were saying we should be taking some affirmative step towards solving these problems. Right. And so then you have 30 years later, after the first black journalists show up in our newsrooms, you start to see more of a devotion to more systemic type of integration. Right. But then we know what happens after that. Uh, We we know that that those programs didn't quite move quickly enough, didn't solve the problems, faced, faced significant resistance in many places or people who just didn't feel so good about that. And and then the and then the economy upended. Uh, all these newsrooms as is. And in many cases, the, fr- the last people who had been hired were the first people out. Well, who were those people? All the people who just been brought in via the programs, right? And, and, and so by the, time we get to the t- by the time we get to our current reckoning, we got a lot of newsrooms that demographically don't look that different than 91 or even 54, right? Like, it's just like, where it's like, oh yeah, that's our black guy. He's over there, right? Or that's our black woman, or that's our, that's our one Latino. <laughs> like, it's like, and, and um, and so what I think is going to be crucial to this moment, right, and none of this is about the seriousness with which I think people are taking it, 
or how moved they were by George Floyd's death or by the protests or the demonstrations. None of this is to suggest that none, that these efforts aren't in good faith, but it's can we actually construct systems within the institution that propels and perpetuates this when the streets literally aren't on fire, right? Or are we going to look at this once every 30 years, <laughs> right? And, and we'll be here again having a panel discussion in 2045 about whatever. <laughs> and we'll be like, well, but didn't we have a reckoning about that in 2020 after the... And so I, I, so I think a big part of it is how much can we actually institutionalize in real ways, these questions about coverage, about hiring, about, you know, I, I was talking to our former colleague, Margaret Sullivan at the, at the Post, I was talking to her over the weekend. And I said, look, you know, people tend politics, they talk about the idea of budgets being moral documents, right? You lay out what you want. And, and, and I said, look, I mean, newsroom staffs and, and the newsroom budget, what you cover and what you don't, and some is a statement of values, right? And who you hire and who you don't and who's in the room and who you isn't, right? And so what we saw, and again, this is not about the personal motivations of any of the individual hiring editors or places, but what we saw was when the economic turned down, economy turned down and places had to cut back, right? These papers wouldn't have been caught dead without a city hall reporter, yet many of them were caught dead without a black person on their staff. And so what did that say about how integral that diversity was to their, to how they saw it, right? If they thought it was imperative, it would have still been there. And so in that moment of stress and of pressure, it really tests what are our values. And, and, and so what the hope is that in this moment, as we have this conversation, as more people of color are in, in bigger and more prominent positions across our industry and in, in propelling this conversation, that we can start building in the safeguards and in the structures and the systems. It's not just about promoting a person here or doing a thing here, but saying, no, 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 when we hire, this is how we hire. Or this is how we are having our relationships with the community in the Holly is so important that we're gonna structure that into how we cover Denver. So that it's immune from, this isn't a special sprinkle on the side. Well, when we have extra money, we send someone over there to do that. No, 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 this is part of who we are. And I think that that, look, I think that the extent to which we're having conversations like that, I think we are having conversations like that across the industry in ways that we had not been even a year or two or three ago. Uh, but those, com but uh, it's, so it's extremely encouraging that we're in that space. And also it still feels to me, at least like there's a long way to go to figure all of that out. And I would just say, yeah, I mean, thank, I think 2020 and even 2019 with Elijah and McLean and, and, and in Aurora created a desire and sparked that desire from work that was done. And I always say to my students, I mean, that phone in your pocket is, I mean, I don't remember her name, Vanessa or whatever, the 17 year old yes. girl who shot the George Floyd video. I mean, that was the journalism that shook the world. Yeah. Darnella and, Frazier. Yeah. And, and uh, so I think it, it, it did create a desire on the part of a lot of people in the horror of seeing that to do it. But the disconnect for me, the question is like, what about the ownership of these institutions and of these media companies? Are they going to want to implement it or even be able to or willing to implement with the resources required to make that happen? So that I don't is, is the question. Well, and, is, and I know too, that there's this big question about when we talk about black communities and coverage of black communities, you know, again, we, we can accept historically, right? That our newspapers were not for those communities. We know that it's not it's not who they were attempting to serve. It's not who they were covering. It's not who they were, and and so the question becomes today, how is that remedy right? And the solution is not and the solution is not always or not just or maybe not at all more coverage about those people for the people we are actually writing for, right? It's this it's this question of like how do we what is the what do the residents of the Holly want from the Denver Post, right? Which probably isn't a bunch of like violent safari pieces about look at us in the bad place where it, it, it's, it's that if we're gonna be in communicate, if we're gonna in community with people that we haven't been in community with before, we gotta actually listen to them about what it is they want and how we build trust and, and what coverage they need and how we service them, right? And I think that- And to understand the complexity of that because there's a lot of divisions, there's a lot of- And there's you know, the nuances and there's the, and we can't have individuals being asked to stand in for an entire, for entire communities. And, and so, but again, 
all of that requires resources and time and commitment, not today we're sending a reporter to this place to write about this piece and this is our effort, right? You know, it's this idea of, no, we actually have to be there and understand the nuances and understand the complexities. And that's what then allow, and again, and these are people we haven't had relationships with before collectively, which means they might have some ideas that sound different than things we're used to. If we knew what they wanted, we already would have done it. Like it was like this. And so I think there's that, I think there's some of that too, right? I think that going to that neighborhood or that place where an outlet doesn't have the relationship and really having those conversations, that feedback is going to look different than the feedback from the current readers. Why? Because the, these aren't the current readers. They want and need something different. I think so. I think there's a big conversation there. And I, I think, like I said, I, I think I would. I'd, I'd encourage, I think there are a lot of places that are really working hard at this and doing some of these things in good and smart ways. Um, I do think a lot of the innovation is coming from the nonprofit space or from these more, you know, like in part because they're just, there's, a, there's a nimbleness that's different sometimes, right? I really like an organization we worked with the Marshall Project called uh, that it started with City Bureau in, in Chicago. They've since expanded to Cleveland. They have a program called the Documenters. And what the Documenters are is they are people who, they are local residents who are trained and paid to cover public meetings in their communities. And, um, and, and so what this does is this engages local residents and communities that otherwise do not have a relationship with the media, uh, provides them a level of lead, uh, media literacy, pays them for their labor and their work, um, and also creates a public record of what the East Cleveland Zoning Board Committee did yesterday, a thing that well, in the good old days, the plain dealer might have had a reporter they could send to, but the, re the reality is today they do not. Well, there's an event. What, what do we gain by being able to pay someone fifty dollars to go do that? And now they and now they're part of the media ecosystem. They're more civically engaged. They know what's going on, and we've created this record. And so I've done some work with them and some other. Like I said I think there are a lot of any number of innovative ways to try to, to to try to address some of this. I think the difficulties are when we from the ivory tower try to dictate down, well, look, we care about your community now. And this is why we have done an eight part series on your community, right? And all these people are like, who are you and why are you here? <laughs> and I, like, and, and I, I think it's gotta be much more collaborative than that. you know. Right. Well, we're nearing the end of our program here. I wanted to uh, make sure that somebody uh, watching us online got a chance to ask a question. It might be one of your readers. Julian wants to know uh, what if you could talk about your because you perhaps took so long on the book. If you could talk about your fact checking process and and what that was uh, beyond talking to you know to the main character and and allies. Yes. Um, so I mean, I interviewed hundreds of people for the book, and um, one of the uh, most mistaken things that has been said about the book is that it's like uh I, so I've taken a lot of sort of shrapnel pointed at Terrence Roberts who is the main character of the book and who's someone who is a rabble rouser is virtually a whistleblower in my view and someone who has uh you know not always doesn't always go about things in a way that I would but doesn't uh, pull any punches when he's uh calling things out um, I had two fact checkers. We had the book lawyered. Um, as I mentioned before, um, there were a few mistakes that were called to my attention and I am sorry for them. There, there were things about a wrong church. Someone didn't go to this high school. In one case, I said someone was an ex gang member, not a gang member, by the way. And in any case, a lot of people think he used to be a gang member, but it's fine. He's, you know, that's been changed. Uh, so I went through a significant <laughs> effort and, uh, it's pretty much hard to do a 400 page book without any, uh, mistakes in it. But, um, of course I, 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 I strive to not have any, and the, what has been interesting as I've noted before is the laundry list of things that are wrong with the book that are actually not wrong with the book. Some of them aren't even in the book, um, and, uh, you know, have been tossed around, uh, as ways to discredit the book and that whole, you know, reaction uh, to the publication of the book has actually been extraordinarily revealing about, um, basically to me, it, uh, it, it underlines the findings of the book when you think about who it's coming from and what they're saying. 
Um, but in any case, of course, I, I did take it seriously. We had, uh, like I said, two fact checkers, a lawyer, and I, and I tried uh, as best I could. I didn't go into it. Uh, I did not rely on Terrence Roberts for my, he became the main character and he was a way to uh, uh, see the story through his eyes. And he was a main character. It's very complex, by the way. I've had people read the book and tell me they didn't like him, who other people read the book and loved him. I didn't try to make him into a hero or anything else. I thought he was a fascinating and very complicated main character. Um, and that's why I thought that he was a, a good main character, but it is not his story. And it's not um, you know a story only told from his perspective. So if there's any other mistakes, uh, I'll, I'll take on uh, all the blame for that. He was not, oh, by the way, I didn't pay him. Yes, I did have a mentee who was murdered, who was in blood. Yes, I lived in this house where there were shots all the time. There's so many falsehoods that have been said. But in any case, no, especially I didn't pay Terrence and I didn't, uh, I didn't go into it actually with anything. I didn't know how I'd come out of it. And of course, Terrence and I had very hard times throughout it. And I think his story is very complicated to this day. One of the things that I think is interesting about it is how much gray area there is in the story. And guess what? That's real life. Like there's, there's some pieces of this story that might fall a year or two or 10 from now. And there's others we may never know. And I got as far as I could, and I think I uncovered what I could. But um, yeah, thanks for the question. All right, final question. Uh, you just both taught classes here at Colorado College. If you could each tell us one thing that you learned from the students here mm -hmm. that you will remember and take away as you go on and continue practicing journalism in your lives. I, I, I would say, you know, one of the things I really looked forward to in coming and and. and, and being with the students is, you know, for those of us who talk about journalism and media, we very often spend a lot of time having these conversations with fellow nerds about it. And we don't spend a lot of time talking to our actual readers or our consumers or our aspirational readers. Um, so what I mean by that is, you know, as someone who works in the field and who knows a lot of people who work in the field, you know, I feel like I'm in the like one percentile of media consumer. I could name every columnist at the New York Times. I, I know, I understand the publication schedule of the Washington Post. I know that 60, I know who the 60 Minutes correspondents are. I like, that's not the average person who's consuming our, our work. Uh, it's very far from it. And one of the things I appreciate in this moment as we're trying to grapple with these big questions about the future of the industry and the future of the institution is we have to have more of those conversations with people who are our readers. And what I appreciate about the students and I appreciate about the students who I got to work with these last few weeks is that they are engaged, intelligent, smart, normal, non-journalism nerds. <laughs> they consume some journalism sometimes. <laughs> and, and that is extremely valuable in terms of understanding um, and, 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 and so therefore our conversations about what does work and what doesn't work, about what, what journalism could look like in the future, in many ways are much more valuable than me and five of my friends from a newsroom that I work in having the conversation over beers. Because uh, if any of us knew how to fix it, we already would have. Um, and, and, and so it, it has just been the perspective um, and the eagerness, you know, I just, I had a great class, you know, we did a full discussion class. We talked basically every day and, and they, um, and they really drove the class. I came in most days with not enough notes and we, and, and, and they, and they propelled things through the finish line. So it was, it was, it was a really great space for just thinking and meditation and, and, and conversations about the future of the, of our industry. I mean, I guess, I mean, one thing I'm thinking of, and it was kind of what we talked about a lot in my class, uh, was, um, the question of how is the best way to tell certain stories. And there was a real interest, especially now. I mean, you know, people in my, like my colleagues in age group and here you are than me, but yeah, I mean, you probably also know what I can say, but it's what I mean when it's just like, you know, kids today are just growing up, like they can just technology is whatever. And like, and I was able to grab onto it and, you know, I could, I managed to, to make this documentary, but what was really interesting and I thought really useful in, in the light of what we're talking about and where is journalism going today is how 
do you tell stories and what are the different materials you can use and gather? Because that, that, that can include a photo. It could include audio, a piece mm -hmm. of audio. It can include a piece of video. It can include, and these are the ways where like where we're heading in the future, which we've sort of just been scratching at and everything is in, of course, there's a lot of innovation going on and, and, and we've seen this, but is a real desire to think about like what ways there are to tell a story most powerfully and most importantly and most memorably or impactfully. So that I thought was great. And, and we, we just had a lot of talks about that. And I think that the students um, today are well equipped to take this to another level of integration of that kind of thinking. Well, thank you so much for uh, taking the time this evening and uh, taking even more time with students here at uh, CC. Of course, Corey, thank you.